before we start with today's um, subject, Deep Learning 2, second Deep Learning lecture, uh, a little bit of admin. Firstly, you've started your projects now, you've declared your direction, you've uh, decided what you're going to do, uh, or what you're probably going to do. Um, just one reminder, in the first methodology lecture, I talked to you about um, the importance of uh, not overusing your test set. Right, if you have a test set, ideally you use it only once. You state your hypothesis and you use your hypothesis, you test your hypothesis on your test set once. And the more hypotheses you test on your test set, the more multiple testing you're doing and the less reliable it becomes. So if you're checking hyperparameters, let's say you're doing an SVM and you're checking lots of values of this C function, trying to figure out what that should be, um, don't do that on the test set. Do it on a validation set. So split your training, your a whole day bag of data into a test set and a training set, and split your training set into training and validation, and then do your hyperparameter optimization on your validation set and not on your test set. Save your test set for the very last thing you're going to do in your project. The day before you write your final report, you publish your final report, hand it in, you run all of your experiments on your test set only once, so that you don't overuse it, which means you need to split it off now. Take your, if you have some data already, split it off now and no, don't look at it again until the end of the project. That's why I'm reminding you because if you don't do this and if you go happily training on all your data, you reach the end of your project and you don't have a test set anymore and you can't go back, right? So be careful and do that now. If you have your data already, if not, if a part, large part of your project is gathering your data, then be sure that once you get it, uh, you split it off. And if you're doing a Kaggle competition, odds are there is already a canonical test set there that you have to use. Um, so just remember to put it aside and not, not to look at it. Uh, secondly, I've got a few emails about people wanting to do bachelor projects in machine learning and asking if I might be available to supervise. Um, I'm not, uh, I don't have a lot of teaching budget left after this course. Uh, so I'm probably only available to supervise two or three bachelor projects. Most of you may run screaming from the idea that's okay. Then uh, don't worry about this. If you would like me to supervise, uh, please send me by email a short description of the subject you would like to do. Come up with a good subject uh, or a sort of direction you would like to go in. Send a short email. And by the end of this week or next week, I'll uh, pick two or three and let everybody else know so you have time to look for another supervisor. Uh, that's only for computer science students. The IMM students have already started their bachelor project. And finally, Last bit of admin before we start. The rubric. Who doesn't know what a rubric is? Never heard of this before. Very good. Uh, there's a rubric online on Canvas, which we will use to grade or to get a preliminary grade for the report. And it always surprises me how many students don't look at the rubric when they start, because it's basically a step-by-step -step guide to getting a good grade. And obviously it's not about the grade, it's about learning and it's about the quality, but if you do want to get a good grade, just read this and do everything it says and you can't fail. So it's 10 minutes investment and you'll get probably two points uh, on top of your grade just for reading the rubric. So please have a look at that. Uh, oh yeah, final bit of sort of not admin, but uh, only something that's really only interesting maybe for the people doing machine learning projects, uh, sorry, doing deep learning projects. Uh, it can be quite intensive on your uh, computing power, especially if you have to do everything on your laptop. A uh, good way to have your cake and eat it too is to do something called transfer learning, where you download a big model that somebody else has trained. For instance, the VGG model. This is some QRS code for how to download the VGG model, which is a big convolutional neural network that somebody had trained, I think, three years ago on a huge data set. They took a lot of work, used, uh, used a cluster to train this, and then they put the weights online for you to use. It's about a, a gigabyte of neural network weights. You can download that, you can load it into Keras, and you can use it. You don't have to train it yourself. You can build something on top of it. You can remove the last few layers and build your own stuff on top of it. But you get this massively powerful feature extractor for images that you don't have to train yourself. So um, if you're doing deep learning, um, look into this. It might be applicable to your problem. Uh, it's called transfer learning, and if you Google transfer learning Keras, then you get lots of 
tutorials for how to do that in KOS. If you're not doing a deep learning project, well, it's a technique to be aware of, but don't, uh, don't worry about it. So, let's uh, get started properly. Um, this is the plan for today. Firstly, we have some leftovers, which are just things don't necessarily fit the theme of today, but things I forgot to mention or didn't have time to mention in previous lectures that are important to know. Techniques a bit like the transfer learning that you should know exist at least, you should know the names of. So I'll run through those very quickly so you've heard them. And then we go into the topic of today, which is generative modeling, which is given a data set, um, model a distribution for this data set so that you can sample from it in such a way that you can sample from it. And there are a couple of ways to do that. The first is generative adversarial networks. It's a very big subject. I'm going to uh, go through it quite quickly. Basically, I didn't want to skip it because all of the cool examples that I showed you about what deep learning can do, if you look at it, use this method. So I didn't want to withhold this from you. I thought I should show you at least uh, how it works in principle. Uh, but it's kind of a weird method. It's not that fundamentally interesting. So we're going to go through that quickly. And then in the second half, we are going to talk about uh, the variational autoencoder, which is a bit more of a principled method to approach this problem. And in order to do that, we need to review briefly some stuff that we talked about last Thursday uh, about the expectation maximization algorithm. And we're going to take a slightly different perspective on that algorithm, which is going to help us to construct the variational autoencoder. So lots to get through. Uh, this is one thing I forgot to, uh, to mention or a contrast I forgot to make. We have this basic machine learning recipe that I told you about earlier. Expect your features, choose your models, search for a good model. And deep learning is kind of a machine learning approach with a slightly different method, slightly different basic recipe, where you design your model. So you don't just pick a model off the shelf, but you design it and you look at the basic modules that are available and you chain them together. Modules like the convolutional neural network that we talked about uh, in the first deep learning lecture. And you chain these things, th these things together to create a model that does what you want where each module is defined as something having a tensor input, tensor output, and some parameters, possibly. It may also be something that doesn't have any parameters. Then you determine your loss function on top of that model, which is the function that takes your output and somehow translates it into a parameter, uh, sorry, into a single scalar, which is big if the model is bad and small if the model is good. So it's always this, uh, this is your model with some input, some output. These can all be very high dimensional, uh, high rank. But then on top of it, you have to put a loss function, which translate that, translates that to a single output, possibly for a given data set. So once you have this complete model with your basic model and your loss function, um, you then apply gradient descent to optimize the parameters of the model. So in some sense, this is more generic and more in-depth than the basic machine learning recipe because it, here we don't pick a model off the shelf. We design our own models based on these Lego blocks that deep learning gives us. In other senses, it is less generic because we tend to fix the search um, algorithm to gradient descent. We tend not to allow any other uh, search algorithms and if there is a, another ser search algorithm that works better, we tend to try and translate it to gradient descent because then we can build these frameworks like TensorFlow and Keras and PyTorch that allow us to do this. So if you work like this, then Keras and TensorFlow will accommodate you. So that's the basic deep learning recipe. Um, something else I forgot to mention last time is the use of loss curves, which are a very, very useful tool. Basically, if you're doing, machine uh, if you're doing deep learning research, a lot of your time you plot these kinds of curves and you spend looking at, looking at them. So this is basically, for, um, horizontal axis is the training process. So these are training steps in your gradient descent. And this is your loss. 
either your training loss or your validation loss. Both are very useful. And you see how your loss, as your gradient descent searches this loss surface, how it goes up and down and up and down. And this tells you a lot. So here I've plotted this for uh, four different learning rates on a basic MNIST classifier. Uh, this is the training loss, by the way. So it could be, for these, this looks very good, training loss going down. This is sort of what you usually want to see. A very steep drop in the first few iterations and then very slowly converging to a better and better solution. Um, but like I said, this is training loss. So it could be that we're overfitting. It could be that actually our validation loss is a straight curve and the model is just completely memorizing the data. But it still tells us um, these are smooth lines, by the way, so in the slightly uh, more uh, um, uh, behind it, you can see the, the, the true, lo uh, true loss, which is slightly more noisy. And you can tell by the amount of noise, you can tell a lot about how your learning rate should be set. Um, you can see this one up here has too high a learning rate, so it's basically not learning. And you can also see that it keeps jumping around sort of this space, looking for the, the place where it can, can go down to a sort of valley of low loss, but uh, it's not finding anything. So we need a, a lower learning rate. Uh, we see that 0, 0, 001 or 0, 0, 0, 0005 give us very good curves, but then when we go to 0, 0, 0, 0005, uh, it starts converging much less quickly again, and it looks even a little bit noisier. This is something very typical you might do if you're doing deep learning research. You set up your model, and then you start looking for a good learning rate, which is the size of the step you take during gradient descent. So loss curves are very important. This is uh, uh, a piece of software called TensorBoard, which integrate quite, integrates quite nicely with uh, Keras. So if you're doing deep learning stuff, then um, please investigate TensorBoard, because it will help you look at your loss curve this way. Um, but like I said, you can look at your training loss and your validation loss, because if your training loss goes down, so you're fit, getting a very good fit on your training set, but not a very good fit on your validation set, the data that the model hasn't seen yet, then you're overfitting. You are memorizing the data, but you're not actually generalizing to new data. If you get new data, suddenly your performance disappears. And there's something very interesting going on with deep learning models and overfitting and generalization which was discovered uh, a year ago, or two years ago, it was published one year ago, where a group of uh, researchers from Canada, I think, did something very simple, very simple experiment. And they showed something very, well, shocking to most machine learning researchers. Basically, they took a very basic classification data set, one of these classification data sets that deep learning models are so good at, so image classification, uh, something that had been shown to, to work very well with one of these deep learning models. And then they took the uh, class factor and they just shuffled it. They just randomized the class factor, just move it around randomly. So at that point, in this data set, the um, instances, the pictures, contain absolutely no information about the class. This is a completely impossible classification set because we've shuffled the labels, right? So the question is, what's the machine learning algorithm going to, what's the, uh, the, the, the classifier, what is the loss going to be? What specifically is the training loss going to be? Uh, this is from the paper. So here you get the loss curve for the uh, true labels. As you can see, it drops down to almost zero a lot pretty quickly. And when you shuffle the, uh, either you ra uh, label it randomly, you shuffle the pixels, you get some random pixel, doesn't matter, you just make it a random data set so there's no, nothing to be learned. And this, what you see is that the training loss still drops to zero. Obviously, it's not learning a good model because there's nothing to learn. So if you, the validation loss is going to stay right up here. But it is still overfitting, and it is still overfitting to zero which means that these models, these um, deep learning models, they can memorize the data. They have enough capacity to get zero training loss, to completely memorize the data, which means, well, at least the way we used to think about machine learning, we, we thought that made them terrible models, 
because if you um, during training time the model doesn't have any access to any other data than the training data. So the model itself, looking just at the loss, cannot tell the difference between this solution and this solution. Because it has no access to the validation data. It, it does, there's nobody telling it that this is a bad solution, even though it is. And somehow what's happening is that from the starting position, so we have two solutions. This is the generalizing solution, which works very well, and the one that it always finds if there is something to learn. This is the overfitting solution where it's just memorizing the data and learning nothing at all. And if you feed it new data, it just doesn't work at all. And both of these solutions are always in your, uh, in your model space. And for some reason, the structure of the model, because that's really the only thing the, the, there's left to explain this, the structure of the model together with the idea of using gradient descent means that if there is a generalizing solution, it always finds it. And if there isn't a generalizing solution, then it runs around until it finds the overfitting solution. Which was a very shocking and weird uh, result in machine learning. Uh, and it also tells us that if this doesn't happen, so convolutional neural networks are very good at this. They have this sort of bias that uh, helps us do this. But if this doesn't happen, and it does tend to go for the overfitting solution, uh, we need to do something about it. So it's easy to see, if your loss curve, if your training loss goes down, but your validation loss stays the same, then you're overfitting. So what do you do about overfitting? Uh, the first is to try and reduce capacity. So if your model is memorizing the data, you can try and reduce the capacity to give it less memory, as it were, less hidden nodes, fewer hidden nodes, uh, stuff like that, to reduce the amount of uh, remembering it can do. Uh, so that's always worth trying. And you can add what's called a regularizer. So reducing the capacity is just making your model simpler. Your whole model class becomes a set of simpler models. Adding a regularizer is a soft way of doing that. It's giving your model a kind of preference for simpler models, where you define simple in a certain way. But the whole model class stays the same. You just give the simpler models a bit more weight. The most straightforward one way to do that is L1 or L2 regularization. Where you basically take the loss function you already have, and you add a penalty term, which is simply if you think of theta as the collection of all your weights. So if you have a big neural network that's a big bag of weights, you put them all into one vector. You take the norm of that vector, how long is that vector? Uh, so you get something like this. If you have just two parameters, it would look like this. So this is one model, this is one model. And you say, if the model has a shorter vector, if the, all of these uh, weights are somehow close to zero, then I prefer it. I, all else being equal, I prefer this one, this model, to this model. And you add that with a hyperparameter lambda, which controls how strongly you are biasing for simple models. And you just define simplicity as how close are all the uh, weights to zero. So it's like tying a rubber band to the origin and to your model. And it can still step around everywhere in the model space, but it has it keeps getting pulled back to the origin. So it's called an L2 regularizer because you are using the L2 norm here. You are defining the size of your model with the L2 norm, which you can generalize to the LP norm. So here to simplify. Um, I've made a, a, just a very basic linear model with just two parameters. So one feature and just the plain L2 parameters W and B to make it simple to visualize. Then we have the basic L2 norm, which is just the square of W plus the square of B and the square root of that, which is just the size of, the, size of this, which you can get from Pythagoras. And you generalize this by saying, hey, this is a, here we, take the square and then we take the square root, why don't we exponentiate to the power of p and then take the p root? And that's not a, well, I won't give you any further intuition, this is just a way to generalize this. And what you get is this, well, this is what we've already seen. So the easiest way to visualize it is to draw 
all the points for which the norm is one, which is another way of saying a circle. So these are all the points for which the distance to the origin, the middle point, is one, which is a circle if you use the standard notion of distance that we all know and, and uh, love. Um, but now we have this generalized notion of distance, so let's see if we change P, what happens to this circle? So if we change P to one, I have to cheat it a little bit, I have to say this is defined as what happens uh, when you take the limit. So you take the limit as P goes to one, so this actually reduces to the sum of the magnitudes of W and B. So these are all the points for which W and B, with the minuses, uh, the negatives cut off, for which the sum of W and B is one. So if you get 0 0.5 here and 0 0.5 here, you end up here, which is one. So this is a circle under the L1 norm. Uh, and just to give you a better picture, if you take P smaller than one, you get something like this. What you see here, but with L1 and with uh, P1 uh, and P smaller than one. If you take this as a penalty on these models, what you can see is that you can get a lot further away from the origin by our normal notion of distance if you move along one of the axes. So if you move along one of the axes, you get a penalty of one here. If you move like this at a 45 degree angle, you get a penalty of one much quicker. which is going to be useful later on. Uh, and um, if you uh, take P bigger than 1, uh, the bigger you take P, the closer you're going to get to this square, which is also called the Manhattan distance. So it's, it's called an LP norm. But for um, loss, what we tend to use for these, uh, these penalties, we tend to use L1 and L2. The other ones aren't uh, used very often. So this is the L1 regularizer, where we have these circles in L1 uh, no uh, norm. And it has this effect of penalizing things more that are not moving along the axis. So if you move like this, you get penalized a lot more than when you move like this. Which is very useful because it enforces sparsity. So if you have some weight vector that is just almost along the axis, so basically what you're thinking, basically what the model is thinking, this coefficient should be zero, this weight should be zero, this weight should be one but it's never exactly zero because it's all numeric and it's all gradient descent, then an L1 regularizer will have the effect of snapping that almost zero to a zero. It, it will create sparsity. It will snap things to the axis if they're close to the axis, which can be very useful because then you have a, a model with lots of zeros, so it becomes sparse, so it becomes easier to store, and it becomes um, easier to read certain things. Certain things just have no influence instead of a very small influence. So in lots of situations, you want this kind of sparsity regu uh, enforcing regularizer. Um, and one way to think of this is if we think of our loss curve as a bowl. <coughs> and gradient descent we think of as dropping a marble into that bowl and watching it roll down to the middle. And the middle is the optimum, which we want to find. Then regularization is like tilting the ball a little bit. If we want to regularize the solution towards this point, we can tilt the ball a little bit that way, and the marble will roll not to this middle point, but somewhere in between the middle point and this point. The more we tilt the ball, the more the marble will roll to this point. That's L2 regularization, it's just tilting this ball. L1 regularization is making the ball square. So if you imagine doing this, you drop a marble somewhere in this ball and you watch it roll down, it's still going to roll down to the center, same as ever. But now if you tilt the ball, what you see is that it's going to roll along one of these ridges on the side of the marble. And all of these points on the side, these are not stable points. It's always going to end up in one of the ridges. And that's essentially what we're doing to the loss surface. Just a couple of pictures. This is our uh, loss surface from the... Um, lecture on linear regression. So this is our very basic linear regression loss surface with a, I've colored it slightly differently. It used to be orange, now it's white, so the details show up better. And this here is our, um, our optimum that we were looking for. If we take this loss and we apply a, an L2 term, it looks like this. 
So as you can see, it spreads out a bit more and the zero point becomes much brighter and all the points near zero become much brighter. So it's not really like tilting the ball, it's more like stretching the ball, but that was just an analogy. Um, and I have to say, I had to add quite a strong loss term to make this visually interesting. But this is the basic idea. And now if we add L1 loss, what you see is that along the axis, we get a lot more bright points. So if you do gradient descent, the search is going to be a lot more interested in points along the edges, and it's probably going to move along the edges. So that's L1 and L2 regularization in. It's not specific to deep learning this, it's very useful in deep learning because we have these big networks with lots of weights, but it's also used in old fashioned linear regression and simple models. Uh, L2 is often known as ridge regression and L1 is often also known as lasso regression. Uh, and if you're doing Keras, then you can choose your regularizers uh, per, uh, per layer like this. Uh, in sklearn, it's uh, less general, but look for rich regression and loss regression if you want to try this. Another thing you can try to uh, help with regularization is dropout. And helpfully, the people who invented dropout put some very nice pictures in their paper that explain it almost perfectly. So here we have a basic standard neural net, and what dropout does, it picks some of the hidden nodes and some of the input nodes, and it just turns them off. And every time you're training, during this is only during training, every iteration you make during training, different nodes get turned off. The idea being that in order to memorize, in order to do this kind of overfitting, a neural network requires co-adaptation. It requires very specific combinations of this weight being off, if this weight is off, and then this is on, and then you can sort of implement lots of these if-then if statements. If this has this state, and this has this state, then this one can do this, and then you can memorize your data. And if you remove, that, uh, if you remove random nodes, and you restrict the network's ability to have this co-adaptation, and you restrict its ability to memorize stuff, and you will find that it regularizes better. So that's dropout. Uh, one thing you need to remember, depending on which framework you use, but this is important for dropout, that um, if, during, if at training time this node is present with probability P, so you apply this dropout, um, and you train these weights for it, and then at test time, you don't remove any nodes. All your activations are going to be massively blown up because suddenly all the nodes are present. So you need to correct for that by um, during test time. So when you have all your nodes present, you need to multiply all the weights by P. And if you do this in Keras, you add a dropout layer. Keras will do this automatically. Keras knows whether you're training a model or using it to predict. So Keras will automatically do this for you. But other frameworks might not. So that's all I wanted to say about regularization and general deep learning techniques. Everything else that's important you can hopefully figure out for yourself. And we can talk about generative modeling. And this is the uh, nicest, most recent example of generative modeling, especially relevant today with the celebrities being in the news. Uh, what they did here, this is uh, work by NVIDIA. They took a big data set of celebrity faces called Celeb A, of high resolution celebrity faces. And um, they trained a generative model on it. So each photograph is a point, which has some highly nonlinear, highly complex distribution in the space of all points. And the question is fit, uh, the, the task is fit to that cloud of points, fit a probability distribution based on neural networks in some way, train it to fit properly, and then sample from it. And these are samples from it. These are non-existent celebrities sampled from this neural network. So it's quite, quite convincing. Uh, so before we go into the GANs, let's uh, talk about the question of how to turn a neural network into a probability distribution. Because a neural network is just a function. It's very deterministic, it has some input, and it produces some output. It doesn't do anything probabilistic by itself. 
So we need to turn that into a probability distribution. And there are two ways. The first is to take the output and interpret that as a probability distribution. So in the rest of this lecture, this kind of diagram will be a stand-in for any kind of neural network. So we've got some input, we've got some output. These are vectors in this picture. And between there could be no layers, could be 100 layers. We don't care. Just any kind of neural network uh, with convolutional layers or LSTMs, doesn't matter. It's got some input, it's got some output. And what we can do to turn this into a probability distribution is just interpret these nodes, these output nodes, as uh, the mean of our probability distribution and interpret these output nodes as the uh, covariance matrix of our probability distribution and then sample from this distribution. And we have a probability distribution. Uh, not a very interesting one because no matter how interesting and complex we make these weights, the output is always going to be this kind of ellipse-shaped multivariate normal distribution. So this can be very useful because it allows the network to say how certain it is about its output. The bigger the covariance is, the less certain the network is about its output, which has the effect of smoothing the loss surface. This can be very useful, but it doesn't produce very interesting uh, distributions, unlike option two, which is to keep the network again like a deterministic function, but we put the probability on the input. So we sample the input from a standard normal distribution, just so a, a multivariate normal distribution centered on the origin with variance one in every direction. We sample a point from that and we feed it through the neural network. That's a probability distribution. We're sampling from some probability distribution. So I tried this just to show you how powerful this can be. So I made a uh, simple neural network with uh, two inputs, two-dimensional inputs, and I sampled from a two-dimensional standard normal distribution. And then I put 12 layers of 100 hidden units on top of it with a ReLU activation, uh, ReLU activation, and then I projected down to two dimensions again for the last uh, for the last layer. So you get a big deep neural network with uh, 12 times 100 uh, hidden units. And then I didn't train it. I just initialized it randomly, no training whatsoever. And then I sampled 100,000 points from this distribution. And this is what you get. So essentially this network transforms a standard normal distribution, circular distribution, into this weird looking point cloud, which reminds me a bit of these starling murmurations that you get with uh, clouds of starlings. So clearly, even if you don't train it, these networks are quite capable of representing quite interesting probability distributions, even without training. And like I said, this diagram could stand for anything. So if you do the same thing, but you use some deconvolutional layers and you make this output a picture, one of these three tensors with a red, green, and blue uh, layer, then you get this, which looks a bit less interesting, but it's still quite far away from us. This is also without training, you get this kind of output. So we, now we have a probability distribution, which is highly nonlinear and which gives us very interesting shapes. Uh, we can do both, of course. We can combine these two, so we can both interpret the output as a probability distribution and give it a random input just to get the best of both worlds. But the main question is, how do we train this? So we have this thing, we know that it can do interesting things even if we don't train it, but now we have a data set and we need to get this model to fit the data set. So we need to change the weights of the network somehow so that the, w the data set becomes likely under this model. And if you do this uh, sort of naively, in a simple and straightforward way, uh, what you might do is to say, well, I sample a random thing from the model, and I pick a random example from my data set, and the further they are apart, the harder I kick my network. So somehow by the loss function, I say these things should be close to each other. Uh, maybe with mean squared error loss, or maybe with some cross-entropy loss, doesn't really matter. I just reward the network more the closer they are 
uh, to each other. And that doesn't really work because you get something called mode collapse. So if these are the modes of our data set, if these red points are uh, likely data points, and the black point is the prediction of our network. And this is quite good because it's quite close to a data point. But we might have picked this random data point for it to be close to. We might be determining the loss with respect to this data point. So we're telling it to go over here. And then if it goes over here, we might be computing the loss with respect to this data point. So then we're telling it to go over here. And however you cut it, however you implement this, what you always end up with is a network that outputs a point right in the middle. Right in the middle from all of these points with high probability. But that middle is not usually a point of high probability. Like if I sample lots of random faces, the average of all those faces is going to look like this, like we saw in the uh, methodology two lecture. But this is not what I want to sample. I want to sample realistic faces, not average faces. This is called mode collapse because these are all the modes. And then when we learn, it collapses into, they all collapse into one mode in the middle in our learned uh, distribution. So we don't want that. We want somehow to prevent mode collapse and we want the network to hallucinate features. It's fine if this guy gets glasses or if he, well, I guess it's, it should be somewhere exactly halfway between a man and a woman. Uh, so it's fine if he becomes a man, it's fine if he becomes a woman, it's fine if he gets glasses or no glasses, if he smiles or doesn't smile, that's all fine, but he shouldn't average over all these possible solutions. We don't want mode collapse. And one way to do that is with generative adversarial networks, which have a kind of weird history. Basically, if we go back probably about six years, these convolutional neural networks were just being used for classification. Basically, six years ago, the idea of having a classifier that could tell you with great accuracy whether or not something contained a bus or not was a pipe dream. It was just impossible. We could do it a little bit, but we really couldn't do it at human level. And then these convolutional neural networks came in and they could do it spectacularly, better than humans can. So that was amazing and there was a lot of uh, hubbub about that. And people started investigating and some people uh, came up with the idea of adversarial examples, which put a bit of a dampener on our enthusiasm at first. So basically this is a um, data set with some uh, labels like... Uh, bus and uh, bird and building probably. And you train a neural network on this and it classifies it spectacularly well. It does really good, it does really well. Also on validation set, just plain very good classifier. And then what you can do is you can freeze the weights and instead do gradient descent on the inputs. So you start with some random input or you start with this input and you do gradient descent to find things, to find inputs that cause a certain class to light up. So for this input, if we do it normally, the, imp the class bus lights up a lot. So then you can start with this input and start looking for small changes you can make to this input so that the class ostrich lights up instead. And you come up with this change, you apply these changes to the, net to the input picture, you get this input picture which looks very much the same to us. But the neural network is 99.9% .9 sure that this is a, absolutely an ostrich. Can't be anything else. And also that this is an ostrich and this is an ostrich and these are also three ostriches. So that put a kind of a dampener on our idea that we have had created basically a human vision system because it could be tricked quite easily by these adversarial examples, which is still a big and interesting uh, field of study. Uh, but it quite quickly it turned around because we realized that we could also use this. If you have a way to generate adversarial examples, you can then add them to your data set as negative examples. Once you can generate a thing that the neural network absolutely thinks is an ostrich and you know isn't an ostrich, you can add that to your data set as not an ostrich and then retrain it. So that's a very, the genesis of the idea of generative adversarial networks. This very simple uh, principle. So let's say to simplify things, we have a binary classifier in this case for two classes, positive and negative. Ostrich, not an ostrich, for instance. 
we use one of these methods to generate some adversarial examples that are clearly to us not in the positive class, but the classifier thinks that they are. We add the ad adversarial examples to the, neg to the data set as negatives, and then we retrain. So we loop and we retrain and we do this over and over again. And if we do this, we get two things. We get the classifier, which is also called the discriminator, gets more and more robust against adversarial examples. And the things it thinks are ostriches start actually looking like ostriches, even if you generate them. But you also get a generator out of this. Every time you make this loop, this generator that generates your adversarial examples will generate more realistic adversarial examples. So we're actually training a generative model. Just kind of a weird one, in this example, because we're doing this gradient descent on the input. So the next step in generative adversarial networks was to make this generator a bit more well-defined. So what we defined earlier was this kind of generator, this is what we wanted. A neural network with some random input, which here should generate things that look like the data. So let's make that our generator and see if we can build a generative adversarial network out of it. And here we have our discriminator, which is just one of these confnets that does a binary classification. And the way you turn this into a GAN, well, first of all, if you have a real example, you just do plain classification. So we get a real example and we just label it here. Uh, we train the network to label it positive or negative, as the case might be, maybe. So if pos is ostriches, then this becomes negative, and we just have some loss function that tells it to be negative. And then for a fake example, let's assume we have some generator. We just randomly initialize the generator at first. We freeze the weights of the generator, and we generate a sample, which is just going to be something like random noise or one of those pictures I showed you earlier. That's fine for a start. And then we tell the discriminator, we put the discriminator on top of this, so it's one big neural network. And we tell the discriminator, whatever this thing generates is not an ostrich. This is randomly initialized, so we can be pretty sure it's not generating ostriches. And this, we update the weights based on this thing. So we mix together the real and the fake examples in this way. And then, when it comes time to train the generator instead, we freeze the weights of the discriminator. So now we say this is the discriminator. Train the generator to generate examples that this guy thinks are positive. So we do the same thing, but we freeze the discriminator weights. We update the generator weights. And here we just use the same loss function, but we tell it to be positive. So this thing is going to learn to turn all of this into whatever needs to be here to make this more positive. Because this is frozen. Oops, sorry. This is frozen. So we're now updating the weights of the generator. Uh, there's a picture missing here. That's a shame. Oh, no. It's uh, so. Um, so sometimes, that's the basic uh, uh, generative adversarial network, but sometimes you want to learn a function from one picture to another. And sometimes you want that function not to be discrete, but to have some probabilistic aspect. So this is what I, something I showed you earlier, where, for instance, here we get as input a line drawing of a handbag, and we want that colored in. And we don't want that colored in with sort of the average over all possible handbags this could be. We want the network to hallucinate details, specific details. Or here, if we want this uh, segmented image to be inpainted with cars and trees, we want it to pick a specific tree and sample that one instead of averaging over all trees. So we're learning a function from input to output, but we still want to sample parts of the, parts of the output. We can do this with a conditional GAN, which works like this. The discriminator gets two examples and has to tell whether or not this is real or fake. And then the generator 
gets the input, generates the output, we replicate the input here, and then the discriminator has to tell whether, this or, whether or not this is fake. And then we do the same thing we did earlier. We just uh, train the discriminator by freezing the generator and train the generator by freezing the discriminator and setting the output uh, differently for each. So then you can do conditional sampling, sampling for a specific input. And finally, um, just to show you how these horse to zebra things were made, sometimes we don't have paired inputs. So if we want to translate uh, horses into zebras, we don't have examples of this is a horse, this is what that horse would look like if it were a zebra. But we do have a big bag of horse pictures and we do have a big bag of zebra pictures. That's easy to get. So can we somehow train on two big bags of unmatched pictures that are not, uh, yeah, that are not mapped to each other, but they are, they do describe their domain very well. Can we then learn how to transform between domains? It's a bit more difficult, but in some cases, in some specific situations, we can do it with this method called the cycle GAN. And basically what they say is, if you just randomly map the pictures in one domain and another domain, you're gonna get this mode collapse again. Because you're randomly mapping things and you're gonna get this averaging and smudging. That's not gonna work. You need some additional constraints. You need something extra to constrain your training process. And what they add, what they do is they just add a term to the loss function. Uh, so what they say is if I'm mapping from one from domain X to domain Y and back, so I'm mapping from a horse to a zebra back to a horse, the result should be very close to where I started out. And if I map from a horse uh, from a zebra to a horse and from a horse back to a zebra, the results should be close together. I should end up where I started out. So you can think of this like an autoencoder practicing steganography. Steganography is the art of hiding messages in plain sight. So like uh, encoding a secret message inside a non-secret photograph. So the job of these generators, if they're generating a picture of a zebra from a horse, is to hide the picture of the horse inside the zebra to keep the detail in there in some way that the original horse can be decoded. And the job of the discriminator, which looks at uh, specific, uh, specific pictures, not paired pictures, but single pictures, the job of the discriminator is to tell, is there a horse hidden in the zebra picture? Is there a zebra hidden in this horse picture? And then you can do, sometimes you can do very cool stuff like translate horses into zebras. That's all I'm gonna say about guns. They're very difficult to train. So it may seem like a very simple, it is a very simple idea. And if you feel like trying it, please do. But don't feel too uh, bad if it doesn't quite work because they're very finicky. Um, I had some stuff but I'll leave uh, about autoencoders, but I'll leave that for after the break. So let's have a fifth, whoop, well, let's have a 15 minute break. And then we're gonna talk about EM and variational autoencoders. It doesn't always work. Okay, so welcome back. Um, so just to remind you, we were talking about uh, generative, uh, generative models, ways to sample, ways to sample uh, things that are like your data, like images. And um, we're going to talk about variational autoencoders. We're going to work towards variational autoencoders. So let's start with a gentle reminder of what autoencoders are. I talked about it very briefly at the end of the last uh, deep learning lecture, but it was slightly out of time. So let's talk about this again. Basically, an autoencoder is some neural network where you put the input on both sides of the neural network. So it takes an image, in this case, as an input. And its job is to reconstruct that same image. But one of its hidden layers, the middle hidden layer, is very small. So all the information has to go through one small layer in the middle. So this might be a 64 by 64 pixel image 
And here, let's say we have just two, two nodes in the hidden layer. And then from whatever ends up here, we need to reconstruct the image again. So here you can just put the, uh, the input again and compare it with, uh, with mean squared error loss or something, or binary cross entropy. And uh, the neural network just learns to construct the, uh, reconstruct its input. And what you can then do is take this, uh, this code here, this representation here in the middle that you get for your input, you can take it as a representation of your image, a low dimensional representation. So for instance, if you plot the original images in two spaces, so you have X and Y, X and Y, in a two dimensional space, if the um, autoencoder works well, then you will see images that look similar and often look semantically similar, so the same person, they will be clustered in this two-dimensional space if your autoencoder works well. So something we can do is treat this bit, the decoder, like a generator. So if the encoder works well, then anything in this, uh, any point near this guy in this space when I decode it, should look like this guy. And any point here should look like her if I decode it, even if the point doesn't or originally correspond to a, a point in my data set. So that gives us a very simple ad hoc algorithm for generative, mo generative modeling. We just train an autoencoder. We encode the data into latent variable Z. So that's this here, that's called the we call that the latent variable. So we just run all the data through the encoder, and we get a point cloud in this low dimensional space. We fit a multivariate normal distribution to that point cloud, or any other distribution that we can easily fit. We sample a point from the NPN, and then we decode the sample. So we encode the data into this space, we fit a distribution to that data, we sample a random point in this space, we feed that point through the decoder, and then we get a random face, ideally. So I tried this over the weekend. This is my input data set called labeled spaces in the wild. Uh, I trained an autoencoder. It's not a very good autoencoder, I'm afraid. I didn't have a lot of time. So these are the reconstructions. You can sort of see, well, a lot of details get lost, but it's basically reasonable reconstruction. Uh, these are the first two dimensions. The hidden dimension is uh, 64. The hidden layer is 64 dimensions in this data set. So these are the first two dimensions I've plotted. The blue cloud is uh, my data. So I translate my data into this uh, latent space. I get this blue cloud. I fit a normal distribution to this blue cloud. And I sample 400 points from that normal distribution, which are the red points. And then I feed these 400 normal points, uh, 400 red points to my decoder, to the top of my autoencoder. And I get something like this. So it's, you can tell them apart from the reconstructions because it's an autoencoder, so it's a, uh, not a great model. It's uh, not as good as the variational autoencoder, which we're going to look at. But it works pretty well. So these are, this is a generative model over faces. So why isn't that fine? Why don't we just use that, apart from the fact that it doesn't work super well um, what else do we want to get out of it? Well, the nice thing about the variational autoencoder is that it's defined from first principles. So it's defined from the idea that we have a probability distribution. And what we're looking for, the weights, W, that we're looking for, are the weights that give us a maximum likelihood. We are basically going to do everything from this maximum likelihood principle, where we optimize the weights of the neural network so that the data is as likely as possible to maximize the likelihood of the data under our model. Uh, this is uh, what we call a hidden variable model. So we have, we assume the data is generated by this process. There is some hidden variable Z that is sampled in some way, which is combined with the weights of our model to produce X. In our case, Z is this input vector that we've sampled from the standard normal distribution. Theta are the weights of my neural network. 
and together they produce x, which is the observed data. So what we observe is not the complete data, it's the partial data, because we observe the output, but we never observe the actual latent variable that was supposedly used to generate our data. Um, this is very similar to what we saw last week, Thursday, in the EM lecture, where we had a uh, Gaussian mixture model, where theta were the parameters of three Gaussians, three normal distributions, with some mixture weights. So we have means, sigmas, and some mixture weights. The z for a specific x is the component one, two, or three that generated that particular x, and then x is the data we observed. And uh, we get this uh, probability density function for the whole mixture of these three uh, normal distributions. Uh, here's what that looks like. In higher uh, dimensions, we have theta, which are the, uh, the numbers, set of numbers that describe these three normal distributions. We have some points, x, which we observe. And then z are the responsibilities that each component takes for each point. So one is very far outside of the red component, so the red component takes very little responsibility for the point x. Uh, so this, whenever you see theta and x, you can map it back in your head to something like this. Although there are many other hidden variable models possible. Uh, but for uh, EM, we had a good solution. We had a good way to fit this kind of model using expectation maximization. So let's see if we can translate this kind of approach, this kind of model, to the neural network scenario and see if we can end up with something we can use, which, spoiler alert, is going to be the variation autoencoder. So um, we had a few problems in fitting uh, Gaussian mixture models to data. First is that we, uh, if we simply write down the, the maximum likelihood criterion, we want to maximize the data with respect to our parameters. We want to choose the parameters that maximize the likelihood of our data. Um, we can take the derivative of this with respect to all the parameters, but it doesn't lead to a closed form solution because we have a sum inside the logarithm. That's never, I mean, we can chain rule that and get some, um, get some gradient out of it, but it's never going to simplify it like it would if the sum were outside of the logarithm. So we can take this z, think about the x as, inc uh, we think of x as incomplete data, data that is missing a certain uh, bit of information, namely which x corresponds to which z. And we can just imagine a complete data distribution where we do have this z. And we have, an, we get, a, if you work this out, you get a very nice, probability distribution with the sum inside the logarithm, uh, the logarithm inside the sum. The problem here is to get rid of the z again, because we don't have the z with our data, you have to marginalize it out. You have to sum over all possible uh, z. Just take the marginal distribution like we talked about in the probability one lecture, probabilistic models one lecture. The problem is that this sum is huge. If you have two components and uh, 10 data points, so every data point can have component one or component zero, then you have two to the power of 10 terms in this sum. Two to the power of 10 times you can assign, uh, ways you can assign the components to the data points, uh, which is about a thousand. And if you have 20 data points, it's about a million. And if you have 30 data point points, it's about a bi billion and so on. So a billion is about the most you can usually, most things you can usually loop over in a normal program. So that's about the limit of what we can hope to do with just two components is a data set of 30 models, which is not exactly big data. So that doesn't work either. We need to figure out a way to not compute the whole of this sum, but compute only the relevant terms of this sum, which is essentially what the EM, EM algorithm does for us. And it works on the following very simple uh, intuition, that we cannot optimize for theta and z together. We cannot pick the optimal z and the optimal theta. 
But if we fix data, if we say we know this is the model, we know these are the components, then we can call other points, then we can uh, choose Z, we can assign responsibilities to all the data points. And if we have Z, if we have the complete data, then we can easily optimize for likelihood, uh, optimize data for the likelihood. We can do both. We can iterate this. So we pick some random Z, we get a good, uh, we, sorry, we pick some random theta, we get a good Z. We pick some random, uh, we take that good Z and we optimize for theta, we throw the old theta away. And we throw the old Z away with the new data and we iterate this over and over again. So that looks like, looks like this on the uh, old faithful data set. Uh, so we pick two random components, blue and uh, red here. And then we assign responsibility to the points. So the blue points take a lot of, uh, blue points, the blue model takes a lot of responsibility for these points. And then the red points, the red model takes a lot of responsibility for these points. And we have a line of purple uh, points in the middle where the responsibility goes uh, halfway to either model. So each model takes about 50% responsibility for these points. And we throw away these original components and we fit new components to the points according to probability. So this model is fit mostly to the red points, to the red point, oops, sorry. Mostly to, mostly to the red points. And this uh, model is fit mostly to the blue points. And uh, what you get is a kind of weighted, for instance, if you compute the mean of this blue uh, component, you get a weighted mean over the data sets where these are weighted very highly, the blue points, and the red points are weighted very low. So that's the basic EM algorithm. Oh yeah, this is the E step, and this is the M step. So we have the same thing, the same kind of principle in our, uh, the model we're trying to fit. Namely that we have some Z, which we've sampled from the standard normal distribution, and we have some output X. And we could very easily fit this if we had a Z paired with every X. If we had long list of pairs of this is your X, this is your Z. And we can just fit the neural network in the same way we fit any neural network. But we don't have these Zs. So we need to somehow get them from somewhere because we can't integrate them out. Uh, and if we just do naive gradient descent, then we get a kind of mode collapse. So can we do the same trick? Uh, basically, if we apply EM here, we would say that uh, if we had some Z for every X, then we could optimize for the parameters. And if we have parameters but no Z, then we can optimize to choose a Z for every X. That's actually kind of difficult to do in a neural network. So we need to go the long way around. We need to do it slightly differently. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to base our analysis on this decomposition of the probability of P, P given theta. So this quantity here, the probability of X, sorry, not the probability of P, the probability of X given theta, that's the thing we want to maximize, right? I mean, ultimately we're not that interested in these Z's. We want to maximize we want to choose our theta so that the probability of x is maximized. And it turns out you can decompose this quantity into these two functions by choosing any random or uh, arbitrary distribution on z, q. So q is some distribution on the hidden variable, z. We get this decomposition, so q is any distribution on z. P is our uh, conditional, is our actual conditional distribution on Z. So actually the most likely Z given, uh, given our output X and given our theta, which in our case we can't compute. KL is the Kullback-Leibler divergence between these two. Um, if your memory is a bit hazy, we saw Kullback-Leibler divergence in the first probability lecture. And it's basically a measure of how different two probability distributions are. And for more information, have a look at another look at that lecture. 
and then L, well, sorry. No, sorry. And then L becomes this function. Uh, which is just sort of what's left over. If you express the this px given theta as the kovac leibler divergence plus another thing, then this is the plus another thing that you're left with. Um, to prove this decomposition, to prove that this is true, we cannot go forward. Normally you would start with px, of px given theta and you would rewrite it using all the probability rules. That doesn't really work very nicely. We Tend to, it tends to be easier to move backwards. So we start with the thing we want to prove. We're going to rewrite it into px of theta. So we fill in the kolbach leibler divergence and this L that we've defined. These are both expectations because this is this quantity summed over all z weighted by the probability on z, by some probability on z. So these are expectations, just simplifying the notation there. Um, we can split out this ln in the logarithm of this minus the logarithm of that. And this minus we can take out of the expectation. So the expectation of this minus this is the expectation of this minus the expectation of this, which means ultimately that these QZs cancel out against, against each other. So we end up with this. Um, <clears throat> and we are basically taking the expectation over a constant uh, uh, so this um, well, um, so we can take the expectations out here which gives us this uh, and if we move uh, slightly confused. If we move this to the other side, we get that this times this, and they made this actually, no. We get that this, uh, this times this multiplies into this. So you take these two logarithms and you push them together. So basically, if you take the logarithms out of here, what you end up with is the uh, definition of the conditional as the uh, conditional distribution. So this holds. So I got a little lost halfway there, so if you didn't quite follow along, don't worry, just take my word for it. This decomposition uh, holds. We can rewrite px given theta as this plus this. Why is that useful? Because it means that this quantity, this LQ theta, is a lower bound on the thing we want to maximize. It's called the variational lower bound because it's a function of another function, like the entropy and then the kolbach leibler divergence. It's a function that takes another function as its argument. That's called variational. Uh, doesn't really matter for us because the function is defined by its weights anyway. But that's why it's called a variational lower bound and that's why it's called a variational autoencoder. So we have this quantity, this L, and that's a lower bound for the thing we want to maximize. So if we make sure that whatever we do, we're always maximizing L, then we can be sure that we're also always maximizing Px given theta. That's useful because L is a lot easier to maximize. So this is what, the, uh, what we basically have just shown. We have some ideal that we're looking for. Px given the optimal theta, so it's called the optimal theta, theta hat. We don't know theta hat, but we have some other theta, which is smaller than that because this is the theta for which this is the biggest. So any other theta, it's as big or a little bit smaller. And this px given theta decomposes in the, to these two quantities, L and KL. And what the E step of the algorithm does, of the EM algorithm does, is it says, given with starting with some Q, choose a new Q so that the kolbach leibler divergence becomes zero. Essentially set Q equal to phi because kolbach leibler divergence is only zero if these two things, if its two arguments are, uh, are the same. So essentially 
in the M algorithm, we set Q, we choose a new Q and we set Q equal to T. So this is just this big colorful matrix we computed. We just compute P, the probability of Z given uh, X and theta, and we set that as our new Q. So then the KL divergence becomes zero and L must therefore take up the full, uh, full length of this quantity because we've only changed Q, so this quantity doesn't change, right? Because if this was independent of which, this decomposition was independent of which Q we chose, so we just change Q so that the KL becomes zero, so that this becomes then the full length of this quantity. And then in the M step, we fix Q, and we choose a new theta so that L becomes maximized. We optimize our parameters to maximize L, which means that L is going to become bigger because we choose new parameters so that L is maximized. We get a new kullback leibler divergence because we've kept Q the same, but we've changed P because there are new parameters. So this whole thing becomes bigger than it was. Essentially what we've done here is we've proved that EM converges because whatever we're doing, whether we're doing, if we're doing the E step, this quantity stays the same. And if we're doing the M step, this quantity gets bigger. And that's the quantity we're trying to maximize. So if we keep doing this, the uh, likelihood, probability of X given theta, is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's never going to get smaller. So it's going to converge to a local maximum. It's going to converge either to the optimum or to a local maximum. Uh, yeah, and if you work this out for specifically for the Gaussian mixture model, setting Q equal to PZ just means computing the responsibilities like we saw in the last lecture. And you get this kind of matrix of responsibilities and if we choose theta to maximize L, well then we have a very basic maximization problem where we just get an arc max of this which has a logarithm neatly inside the sum. And we can just take the gradient and do lots of math and lots of rewriting and what we end up with is what we expect, the weighted, the weighted mean, the weighted covariance matrix and the relative weights for the mixture weights. Uh, so this is not really the point I want to talk about today, but just trust me, uh, if you do, if you approach the EM algorithm like this, and you do this, you get the, you get what you expect, you get the proper values for, uh, for the E step and the M step. But what we're talking about today, what we're going to try to do is to translate this principle in just over 15 minutes to this generative model, to the neural network model. Um, and the problem here, the main problem that we have to deal with is that we cannot compute this Q exactly. So this Q step, say where we said, uh, sorry for skipping around so much, but this Q step where we said we want to set the new Q equal to the P, equal to the probability uh, of Z conditional on X, we can't do that with a neural network. We have this generated model and we have some z, some x's here. We know the weights and we have some x's. It's very difficult to compute the z, to compute the probability distribution of z conditional on x. So given that we found an x here, what are the most likely z's to have created that x? We can do a kind of gradient descent, but it would be very difficult and would be very tricky. And it's not a route we want to go down. Instead, we try and learn this Q as well. So instead of enumerating this Q function explicitly and setting it explicitly equal to this conditional distribution, we simply make it a neural network. So we want some function that for a given X gives us the correct Z, gives us the correct distribution on Z. So we just write a neural network. It takes an X 
and output some distribution, the normal distribution, why not? And that normal distribution is our conditional on Z given X. So now we have our Q, which is X given Z, uh, sorry, Z given X, which goes from X to Z, which has weights V. And we have our original generative network, which is X given Z, and goes from Z to a distribution on X. And it's already starting to look a little bit like an outer encoder. Uh, but we have this, oh yeah, so now how do we define a loss function for this? Basically, intuitively we can sort of describe what our loss function should be. Namely, uh, if we put an X here, it should produce some Z. We don't have any, don't know anything about that Z. And then given that Z, it should, uh, we should get a distribution here on X for which our data point is likely. And that should ever, that should be true for all our data points. So how do we translate that into an actual loss that we can implement? Well, we start again with this decomposition, except, as I said before, this term is of no use to us. We cannot minimize this term to set Q equal to P. So we're gonna go uh, use this variational lower bound, this L, and we're gonna use it for both steps. So we're gonna say whatever we want to do, we want to maximize L, because L is a variational lower bound, or equivalently, because we're in neural network land, so we want to minimize stuff, we want loss functions, we're going to minimize minus L. And whatever we do, so long as we minimize minus L, we're good. We're uh, we're maximizing this variational lower bound, so we're maximizing the likelihood. So we decompose L again. This is what L uh, was, now written in, this, uh, in terms of these neural network weights. This is just the same L we saw before. It's an expectation with respect to QV. This should be a V. I thought I fixed that. Well, it should be a V. Uh, so it's an expectation of this uh, quantity which we can split up. So this splits out into the, uh, I've removed the weights here to clarify the notation. So this splits out into Px given z times pz. And then the logarithms mean we can do this plus this minus this because it's divided by this. And then we factor in the minus, so everything becomes turned around. So it's minus this, minus this, plus this. Then we can group it back together again. So if we take the expectation of uh, this distribution on Z minus this distribution on Z and we group them together, we get the kullback leibler divergence between this and this. So this is again a kullback leibler divergence, but slightly different because now we have our Q function here still, but now we have on this side the unconditional distribution on Z. So this is the distribution we expect for Z to, Z to follow if we marginalize out X. If we don't know X, what's our distribution on Z? And what remains is the expectation of the logarithm of P X given Z. So now we have a loss function that we can almost implement. Uh, let's look at uh, specifically what this means for a network. So here, this tells us, this part, this term in the loss function tells us that we should minimize the kullback leibler divergence between the output of our Q network and PZ, whatever PZ is, so the expectation on uh, the, the distribution we expect on Z if we don't know X. And basically, we can just choose this. This is a neural network. It has lots of degrees of freedom. We can just choose what we want PZ to be. If it's independent of all the Xs, we can just pick one, pick a distribution. So we can say, we want this to be equal to the standard normal distribution. If we average over all Xs, our distribution on Z should be 
centered on the origin, the mean should be on the origin, and the variance should be uncor uncorrelated and one in all directions. This is nice because if we choose this, then, and we know this is also a um, normal distribution, we have the Kolbach Leibler divergence between two normal distributions, and that works out into a relatively simple thing. You can just rewrite it, I won't do it here, but you can rewrite it and it works out into a very simple expression. So this term is a loss term on this part of the network, which works out into a very simple expression. The other is a bit hairier, the other term, because here we have an expectation uh, over this Q function, over the output of this Q function, of this quantity. Uh, so we can't compute this, because it's an expectation, it's, uh, and it's an expectation with a neural network inside it, so that's very difficult to compute. But we can estimate an expectation very easily by taking a few samples and averaging it, uh, averaging this, this value over those few samples. So we take a few samples, L from QZ, and we just approximate the expectation of this by taking the average over those L samples. And to keep things simple, we can just set L to one and take just one sample. So, now let's go forward, oh, sorry. So this reduces to just, instead of this expectation over this thing, just one, one times this quantity for some sampled Z. So our, it's now starting to look e more and more like an autoencoder. We put some X here. We get a distribution on Z. First part of our loss is how far that distribution is away from the standard uh, normal distribution. And then we sample a Z prime from that. We feed it through this network. We get another distribution on X. And the second part of our loss is the probability of our data the logarithm of the probability density of our data under this distribution. And we have two loss functions which together should optimize our network. And we have only one problem left to solve. With 10 minutes left to go. Uh, which is this sampling part. Because this is not one full end-to-end -end neural network. Because we're sampling in the middle. So you can do this forward, but you can't do it backward. You cannot compute the gradient for these weights with respect to this whole loss function. You can do it with respect to this part of the loss, but not this part of the loss. Because you have to take the derivative through this gradient part, as it were, and that doesn't work. So we need to get rid of this sampling somehow. We need to move it out of the way. And for that, uh, we can look back to the lecture last Thursday, which was a blue lecture where we talked about how to sample from a normal distribution. So if you have a normal distribution that you want to sample from, you know the mean and the covariance matrix, and it's in D dimensions. If you want to sample from this normal distribution, what you can do, ah, come on. That's my laptop, it's a huge problem, there we go. What you can do if you want to sample from this normal distribution, you can take a sample from a standard normal distribution in D dimensions and just multiply it by an A and add the mean, where A is this decomposition of uh, sigma. So that's just a way of sampling from a multivariate normal distribution, which is, uh, which is how, you do, how you do this kind of sampling. We can actually implement this, we can work this into the neural network as follows. So we add to our input, we have one input x, we add some other input e, uh, which should have the same width as this, actually, but which is a sample from a standard normal distribution. And then we make a Q network, instead of making it output a sigma, we make it output an A. And it's a neural network, it can do lots of difficult stuff, so it can easily output a, a precision matrix instead of a covariance matrix. So we make it output A and mu instead of sigma and mu. And then we just multiply this additional input, which we've sampled, 
we multiply it by A, we add it to U, mu, sorry, we add it to mu, and then we get a sample from this distribution here. So now Z is a sample from this distribution, but we've moved the sampling part out of the way. We've moved the sampling part to the input, and now when we take the gradient, it can move all the way through these very simple arithmetic operations. We can take the gradient through there. It can move all the way down to the weights of this Q function. So now we have a loss function, and we have a network. And this loss function, we can just, this network, we can just implement in Keras or TensorFlow or PyTorch. This loss function, we can express in Keras or TensorFlow or PyTorch. And here's the sampling bit that takes E and turns it into a sample. So we can implement this whole thing and we can make Keras derive the gradient. We don't have to do it ourselves. And that's uh, the variational autoencoder. And once you train this for a bit, this is, your gen uh, this is your generated model, or rather this together with this. So if you sample E from your uh, standard normal distribution, uh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, I'm confused, but um, remember that we um, defined the standard normal distribution as the distribution on Z if we don't know X, that we chose that as a definition. So if we sample from this and just put it here, then we have a generated model, which is what we were ultimately after. So I would to end with a few examples of generative modeling in action. Uh, but just to remind you, these are the basic models we discussed. So we have a GAN where we have a, we go a broad and then narrow again, and we put the data in the middle. And the mode collapse is prevented by the discriminator. And we have an autoencoder where we go broad and then narrow and then broad again, and we put the data on the input and the output, and we put the latent vector in the middle. Uh, GANs are, work a little bit better for images, which is why you see them in the media so much and why all these cool examples are always GAN examples, because cool examples are visual, so if you want something visual, you need a GAN. Uh, but they work very poorly for anything else. If it's not an image, if it's not continuous specifically, then GANs work very poorly. Uh, and they cannot handle discrete data like language, like music, symbolic stuff they can't really, uh, can't really generate. VAEs have a much broader appeal. They work for language as well, they work for music. They should work for music, we're working on that at the moment. Um, and they have this nice property that they are derived from first principles. So you write down your graphical model, you try and figure out how do I do maximum likelihood inference on this, and out rolls the VAE. which I can now take off. Uh, so that's very nice because it means it's, it's you, can, you can think about probability in the way you normally think about probability and then apply a VAE to solve your model. Um, the only problem is if you want your latent variables to be, be discrete, so this middle layer, uh, then you can't use a VAE, then you need to use a GAN or something else. Uh, this is what they look like on language. Uh, in fact, this is not what they look like in language. So this is an example of a variational autoencoder trained, of, uh, or a non-variational autoencoder trained on sentences. So we don't train a variational autoencoder, we train a plain autoencoder, like I showed at the beginning. Um, sentences here are read with something called a recurrent neural network, which we're going to talk about next week. But basically you read in the sentence using, a, so you're, Input to the autoencoder is a recurrent neural network, and your output is a, a recurrent neural network. And in the middle, each sentence is still mapped to one hidden uh, hidden layer, to one z, one latent uh, latent vector. And what you can do then is interpolation. You pick two points in your data set, you map them to this latent space, and in your latent space, you draw a line between them, and you decode points along that line which should give you, if your autoencoder works well, you, which should give you a smooth transformation from one point to another. And every point along that line should be 
a sample from your distribution should look realistic. In the case of sentences, it should be a grammatical sentence. If you do that with a normal autoencoder, you get good reconstructions. Reconstructions work perfectly. But what you see is that the interpolated sentences aren't grammatical. I were to buy any groceries. Horses are to buy any animal. Horses to favorite any animal. So they're not very grammatical and they're not very likely sentences. So this is where the autoencoder fails, even though it reconstructs very well. And if you do this with a variational autoencoder, they, annoyingly in this paper, they didn't use the same sentences. But you get something like, he was silent for a long moment, he was silent for a moment, it was quiet for a moment, it was dark and cold, there was a pause, it was my turn. So the transformation is a bit mystical, how it was dark and cold translates into there was a pause. But at every point along this line in this latent space, you get legal sentences that look realistic, that look like they're sampled from your distribution. So the vari variational autoencoder is not just because we want to do things from first principles, it's also a very powerful model. Uh, this is from the um, DCA lecture, if you remember, where we could, where we're doing the same sort of thing, we're projecting down to lower dimensions, and in this lower dimensional space, we could manipulate our point and make somebody smile, or make somebody close their mouth, or make somebody look more female, I think this one. Um, and autoencoders are basically doing that, uh, but much better, in much more, uh, much stronger ways. So here is the uh, uh, some recent work, uh, and here's the the uh, smiling. So you figure out in your latent space which direction is corresponds to making somebody smile. You have to figure that out for yourself. Um, so it's no longer X is aligned neatly, uh, like it was in DCA. So you have to do some figuring out to figure out what the smiling vector is. You get that from examples. You start with a basic starting point and you add a smiling vector, you can make somebody smile. And you subtract the smiling vector, you can make somebody look frowny. Or you can give them sunglasses. Or do we have subtract sunglass vector? So you can guess sort of what they might look like without the sunglasses. So there we have this real in-painting effect. Uh, we have a little transformation as well. That's my last slide. So that's generated modeling for deep learning. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email.